virtuosity. It's about um, there's a how, how many of you live in Berlin? You live in Berlin. Ever? No one lives in Berlin. Okay. <laughs> you all know what Berliner Stolz is, right? <laughs> That's a, <laughs> Berliner Stolz. It's this you know this sort of this this very cheeky way of speaking, like almost slightly aggressive, but it's always packed in this sort of very funny kind of surface. <coughs> there's always, there's a lot of irony, there's a lot of sarcasm, there's a lot of, of um, lots of plays on words, lots of puns, lots of, uh, um, you know, very extravagant ways of expressing oneself. So what lebt von Schiller musste sterben. You know, it's just, it's way too uh, high in some way, you know? but it's, there's always that like really earthy dig to it. That's Berlin Operetta lives there. Um, it's no coincidence, you know, when we think of you know sort of Berlin cabaret of the 1920s, you know, with this very, um, with this you know sort of uh, I can't speak English anymore. <laughs> Dab, gold. What are those in English? Um, like, um, gross. I mean, yeah, like gross. blatant yeah. with its blatant sexuality, yeah. with its blatant uh, aggression. <coughs> you know, with its, um, uh, you know, that kind of. I mean, you've all seen the movie Cabaret, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that it's very clear that that stuff and Berlin Operetta are very closely related. Um, Berlin was the first operetta to really incorporate jazz elements on a like a large scale. Um, Viennese operetta mm, didn't. I mean, they rejected jazz, of course, as an art form. The the later Viennese operettas, you know, they Wagner orchestration, Strauss orchestration, you know, the sort of emo, always more instruments, more lush. Blue Man Hawaii. It's a bit mm. jazz, you know. Sorry? Blue Man Hawaii. Berlin. Oh, that's a Berlin. Okay. <laughs> okay, Weisse Swisser is Weisse Swisser. Okay, is a slightly comp. It's a very complicated. Um, it's a very complicated Entstehungsgeschichte. <laughs> um, there are two orchestrations of Weisse Swisser. No? Um, there's the the jazz one, which has a you know it basically is two big bands in the orchestra plus a symphony orchestra. Um, <laughs> that's not the original orchestration. The original orchestration, I mean, so the thing about Weiss's Whistle, we all know it's by Benatsky, but it's actually by a whole bunch of people um, uh, who were all, um, I mean, 1930s, okay, so. Sorry, Weiss's Whistle. Whistle. Small horse. Weiss's <laughs> Whistle. Uh, very, yeah, um, so, okay, the late. History of operetta is, of course, enormously mm, mixed up with the uh, development of the, the, you know, the Third Reich, Hitler, and the 1930s. All of that stuff plays an enormously big role. Uh, all very complicated. Um, the thing is, there were a lot of Jewish composers uh, participated in Weiss and Swissel, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why it sort of all got put into Benatsky's name, and mm, all very complicated. Um, so there, are, yeah, there are. Whenever anybody does buy this whistle, because it's very, really an enormously popular piece, um, there's always decisions to be made about which orchestration and how much, how many saxophones and how many <laughs> trombones and what, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it possible? Um, but it's such a good piece that people would spend a lot of time you know, doing the, doing the, the, the um, uh, you know, doing the research, digging up the materials, and making it available to. Um, uh, sorry, I have something, hmm, but no, I forgot it. Vice was a, the... Jazz, okay. Jazz. <laughs> Jazz. Jazz. <laughs> okay, totally lost that train of thought, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so, back to Berlin. Um, sorry, I completely lost the plot. <laughs> 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 
talking about the Viennese opera. Oh, right, okay, now I remember. So, um, the, one of the things that, that when, so when did people stop writing operettas? Not, all, not such an easy question. Mm -hmm. Well, later the Revue Operette was more popular. Sorry? The Revue Operette. Revue Operette. Yes, I mean, yes, that sort of, you know, where people like took bits from other operettas and put them all together, you know, took, you know, numbers from different pieces and then strung them all together to tell a new story. I mean, that, people are still doing that today, you know, kind of. Um, there's a piece by Shostakovich, which is name I can't remember right now, but Shostakovich called it an operetta, and it really is. It's a, you know, sort of, you know, okay, socialist realism humor, which is, for us, somewhat difficult genre. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it has, you know, short, snappy numbers with spoken dialogue, and he called it an operetta. Are you, like, can you still write an operetta? That's a very good question. Um, I, I mean, I don't know anybody who's written an opera. <laughs> uh, a little bit the problem now is that any composer who really is a, you know, I mean, really a, like, a, like a serious composer, as opposed to somebody who, like, you know, I, I met a composer once, uh, he writes all the music for Friedrich Schott for last, mm -hmm. you know, and would we call that really an operetta? Not really. I mean, it's a, he's composing music for review. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, sometimes there are song numbers in it, and you, know, you just think, oh, no, it's a you know, it's a song, it's a piece, it's an ensemble that could be in an operetta. Um, but he's writing music to accompany a review, as a you know, as it were. <coughs> I think anybody. I mean, if we think of the you know, really you know, the composers living and working today in Germany, like even the younger guys, like um, Marius Lange, for example, who's written quite a few operas, um, he's somebody who would say, oh, I kind of like this idea, this, this operetta element, you know, I'm gonna have a little bit in my piece that has a kind of operetta feeling, but I'm not gonna write a whole operetta because that would be, it would put my piece too much in one sort of drawer. And I, I want it to be more flexible. So I think composers today are much more interested in taking, you know, elements from the Second Vienna School or from, you know, orchestration from here or influences from here and there and other things. And there are definitely moments where you think, oh, it's an operetta. Um, and there's this guy called Valtignoni also who, in spite of his Italian name, lives in Germany, writes also quite a lot of opera. Um, there's this, there's these really, there's these sort of elements of musical elements of operetta, elements of you know, what would we consider really high opera, also really super complex, super contemporary music, um, all sort of mixed up together. So I don't think anyone would nowadays sit down to write an operetta in the style of Emmerich Kalman or something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how, it, it might even be a big success, but it would be, in terms of marketing, would be a real problem because people would say, well, it's just a throwback to, you know, I mean, if we're gonna have a, a new operetta in the style of Emmerich Kalman, why wouldn't we have more modern music? <laughs> so, um, the plot of operetta, what, what are some of the characteristics of operetta plots? Love. Love, love yes. Unfulfilled, later fulfilled love. Because yeah, of kind of. You already mentioned one of them, which is there's a lot of times there's a love triangle or yeah. a situation where we have an upper class person and a lower class person, which can never work until you find out ah, it was actually royal all along. So exactly, okay. Charnash. Charnash person is the perfect example of that. Can't Charnash feel uncomfortable person. enough that they just overcome the class. Exactly. Know, that's not an issue. Exactly. <laughs> Charnash person, perfect example. You have the prince, she's in love with the with the uh, the dancer, the singer woman in the theater, and his father says, well, you can't marry her, until it turns out that he married a woman who was a singer dancer in the theater. And so, you know, exactly. So then it's suddenly okay. Um, absolutely. Um, Rosalinda in Fledermaus? She's married for a Upper class. Uh, okay, there's a difference between upper class and noble. Oh, okay. Upper class. 
rich. Yeah. No, she's not. No, that's the whole no, point. No, no, no. <laughs> that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Rosalind and Eisenstein are burgerly. No? Yeah. Yes, they have money. They have a lot of money. There's no question. They're wealthy. Um, but they're not noble. Because Rosalind disguises herself when she goes to the ball in the second act as a Hungarian duchess. So there's this you know, very, very clear. As we move further and further into the 20th century, um, we get to pieces like Weiss's Russo. What is the plot of Weiss's Russo? Can you explain the plot of Weiss's Russo? I don't know. I don't know. I Oh, she's from Berlin, so then he's daughter, huh? I don't know. Yeah. Yes, there's, yes. That there's that pair, yes. Yeah, there's yes. there's another, another guy who wants to marry her, and then, ah, but the, the first pair is this, um, from the Weisses of Russell, the weird thing. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, Ober. The exactly. Leopold. <laughs> Leopold, no. <laughs> this is really nice, because, because he loves her so much, but she doesn't want to hear from this. She's like, oh, no. <laughs> And she, he loves her and he wants to, to marry her, but, but she, she's all only looking for the rich guy. The rich guy from Berlin, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, exactly. So, you, you've noticed how difficult it is to explain the plot of this opera. And the reason for that is because there really is no plot. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you watch the Vice of Wilson, um, you realize it's actually it's, it's sort of a meta operetta, as it were. It's, it's not interested in telling a story, like, for example, Fledermaus really has a very concrete plot. It's, it's somewhat complex, but it, there's definitely a beginning and a middle and an end to the story. Whereas in Vice of Suisse, um, there's no story being told. What it is, is a succession of operetta situations. There's the, I hate you duet. There's the, I love you duet. There's the ensemble where the Emperor arrives. There's, you know, and the, 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 it's only situations. There's just a bunch of situations that could be from any operetta, and we're just going to put them in a big long row. And that's what it is. Vina Blut is another one like this. Does everyone, anyone know this? Yeah. I mean, Vina Blut is is a somewhat, again, somewhat awkward. We're going to <laughs> we're going to hear this. You know, it's somewhat awkward applies to so many operettas. Um, Strauss didn't finish writing Vina Blut. No? It was it was not finished at the, uh, um, at the uh, when he died, um, and but he had signed a contract to write it. And so what his uh, what do we call them inheritors? No, his not not Pascovalda, but not Pascovalda. Not Whoever whoever you know took care of his estate when he died. Um, just took a big box of stuff, uh, what you know, everything that was left on Strauss's you know, uh, writing desk when he died, and just took it to the guy who had ordered this Vina Blue thing and said, "Well, here it is. Just you do whatever you want." And so, mm -hmm. well, not Las I mean, the, the, whoever was just taking care of the executor, the executor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so they just took this big box of stuff to the to the the Alptangira and and said, well, this is what you can have. <laughs> so he, you know, they put it together in a sort of complicated story, and and that's how we got Vino Blue. Uh, but again, it's the same kind of thing. It's a it's a bunch of situations. There's there, the plot is really thin. There's not much plot, you know? It's like, he thinks that she's married to that guy, and she's actually married to that guy, and they're married, but not in love, but then, yes, they are in love again at the end. And it's all, there's no plot. It's all about how to create a situation where you can get a really good operetta number out of it, you know? That's the whole point. Okay, um... Five minutes. <laughs> Does anybody have questions at that point? Um, what? What's? Maybe. Um, Can you answer the question that you posed? Oh, when did they stop writing opera? Exactly. Ah, so yeah. I wrote down as well. And when no did they stop writing opera? Well, <laughs> I mean, there's no really good answer to to, to that. I mean, I would sort of say. Um, by the time we get to the Second World War, opera is kind of over. Um, opera 
plays one of the one of the themes, especially in the <coughs> operetta, but also a little bit in the Berlin operetta. One of the themes that is so important is Heimat. Um, who can translate Heimat for me? <laughs> I mean, it's homeland, but it has a kind of um, no, 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 no. It, it has a, it has a, I don't know. The, the, for, to me, there's there's a sort of subtle difference between the English word homeland and the German word Heimat. Heimat is, in, 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 Heimat includes uh, the idea of longing, the idea of you know going, wanting to go back to some place where one came from, but at the same time knowing <coughs> even if I go back, it will not be the same. The, the, it, it has it's this very idea, this idea of an idealized past. Um, you know, I mean, even you know, even in Plato, you know, Rosalinda sings "Klänge der Heimat." Okay, she's pretending. You know, it's not real. It's a it's a performance within a performance when she sings that. But yet she's playing with this idea of of oh, if only I could go back to the place where I belong. It's, that, that's, that's a song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like you're describing like. Almost an idealized childhood, even though I know it's not Absolutely. childhood. Absolutely, exactly. But we can never go back, and we always change how we see it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and that that sort of idealism. Um, I mean, if we think of if we think of the you know the period before the First World War, you know, what in England Edwardianism, or you know here the in, in France the Belle Epoque, uh, in, in in Germany the Gründerzeit, you know, there's this this even though it's um, there's another word for the time after Grundartzeit, um, <sighs> which I can't, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, sort of, there's, there's this feeling of knowing that we are living at the end of times. You know, the sort of Römische Spätzeit. We know that things. Yeah, the Fantasiecke is sort of a, this, you know, this feeling of, you know. <laughs> Of knowing that something is coming that's going to end our way of life, you know, it's a very unpleasant kind of feeling. Um, especially, you know, so so after the First World War, um, you know, Berlin operetta kind of you know drifted off into cabaret. Um, we think of the you know twenties and thirties in, in in Berlin and in. France, after Offenbach, uh, operetta sort of you know drifted back down to the lower levels of society again, um, without any particularly interesting music being written. And Viennese operetta fled into this kind of idealist, idealistic romanticism of the past. You know, and so I mean, Kalman, Kalman lived until what into the fifties, I think. Um, you know, which is his daughter used to come to Ohio right after. Oh, uh, so? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's a little, um, actually, can somebody just Google Kalman's Cal dates? Because um, if I remember correctly, he lived an extraordinarily long life, and, and it's a little um, uh, clement. It's a little <laughs> just sort of like um, uh, to think, oh my god, that man experienced all of that stuff and still wrote these, you know, sort of, Operettas. 1953. 1953, yeah. And he was. Kalman. K A. K L N A N. And you know this this sort of golden haze, like that picture over there. That's the <laughs> 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 sort of this golden haze of opera, you know, of, of of romanticism about oh the past was so wonderful. It wasn't it so great when there were still. You know, kings and queens and dukes and duchesses and princes and princesses who could you know, disguise themselves as peasants and you know experience operatic or operetta-like adventures. You know? mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say with the Second World War operetta, either it became like really you know just nostalgia industry product, or it really drifted off into other directions. Mm -hmm. People who, you know, if they had been born 50 years early, earlier, probably would have written wonderful operettas, um, you know, because of the time, because of what the, you know, the experience that the culture of Europe had gone through with the, with the you know, first and then the second world war. Um, you know, they were, 
not forced is not the right word, but definitely found themselves moving into other compositional directions or other sort of theatrical directions or this you know this sort of I, I mean I can imagine there were you know there was a certain repulsion against this this you know I'm a young man or a young woman I'm a composer in the 1950s and I'm rejecting uh, you know the art forms of my parents you know because mm -hmm. they were the ones who caused you know it, 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 it becomes very very sort of complex social kind of thing but I think yeah. Yeah. As a rule of thumb, Second World War, no more operetta. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes. So then, my question is related to that. I mean, how, how, how relevant is it today? Uh, you know what I mean? Is it having a comeback? Is it kind of? Um, I, mean, I, I know. I know. Julie and I are singing these operetta concerts right now, and it's like the audience is is quite uh, white here. You know, um, and there's that, and they know this sort of trying this that kind of yeah. nostalgia there. But um, I mean, yeah. well, I can tell you this. I, uh, over Christmas, I was in Neustrelitz to, mm -hmm. and I saw Wiener Blut. Yeah. It was fabulous. It was Crazy. so. You can't. You can't. Good. But it was a wonderful production. Mm -hmm. It was so well done. It was snappy. It was witty. It was fast. Mm -hmm. It was so magnificently well sung and magnificently well acted, it was really, really fabulous, and the audience, it was, the house was full, and the audience went mad. So, um, in Neustrelitz, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if we look, look the Komische Oper here in Berlin, I mean, K. Barry Kosky has been very, very interested in reviving this, you know, this Berlin operettas in the 1920s, um, would be great. It was Spolyansky, um, Eine Nacht over Nie, uh, the Balen Savoy, uh, you know, Every season, there's a new thing. You know, they just did they did a couple of years ago. All Arizona Lady. There's another one coming next year. Um, and okay, because Barry makes a huge show of it, uh, and it's a you know it's a big production. It, what can I say? He sells his house out on a daily basis with that stuff. You know, so um, yeah, I. I would say it's very relevant. In a, in a, uh, I mean, I don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, I would say it's very relevant in terms of okay, being a singer looking for a job, um, just because I think every opera house. I mean, okay, the Berlin State Opera doesn't have an operetta in its repertoire right now, right. but I mean, the Deutsche Oper just did a new Fledermaus, you know. I mean, which is quite controversial considering the history of that house, you know. Um, Covent Garden plays Fleda Mouse every year. Yeah. 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 Every day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, well, I, 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 one could argue as far as like, forget like being a singer, you know, internationally, we're dealing with a lot of political farce, <laughs> one yeah. could argue. Um, and for an art form that's based on, like a lot of it is also based on political farce, mm -hmm. like, that's, that's not a hard sell if you're a producer. Exactly. Um, I mean, I think one of the, the, the French operetta with its very strong political aspects um, is it's sort of waiting for its big moment. You know, the, the, um, <laughs> I think that uh, could definitely, I mean, we'll see if somebody, you know, a, a producer or an intendant really, you know, sort of takes it and runs with it. But I can imagine, I mean, the, the, the political raw material is there in those pieces if somebody really wants to, really wants to go with it, you know. Um, you know the, the Grand Duchesse Gerolstein with its, with its, you know, exploitation of lower classes and stuff, you know. So I'm getting a bit tea. Yeah, so I think we need to start with coachings. Yeah. Just so we can keep on a tight schedule yeah. today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I actually, just for everybody, just I rewrote the schedule with the updated times. Okay, I'm so sorry. So yeah. if you, no, no, no. If you, if you want to take a look at 